Hello and welcome to video one for week four. In week three, we talked about change variables for multiple integrals, and we introduced polar coordinates as the important example in R2. This week, we're going to do two important examples in R3, the cylindrical and the spherical coordinates. This video for focuses on the first of those, cylindrical coordinates. I've introduced this coordinate system in previous courses, but let me briefly remind you what's going on. If I have a cylinder, I can identify points in R3 by which cylinder they sit on. We think of these cylinders as oriented along the z-axis and infinitely long. So a point in the cylinder is determined by a radius term, which is the radius out from the z-axis, that tells you which cylinder you're on. Small radius gives you a small cylinder, large radius gives you a large cylinder. Then if we look at the xy plane, we have a circle here, and we can identify a point going around that circle by an angle theta. And this r and theta is exactly the same thing as polar coordinates in the xy plane. So r is how far we are out from the z-axis, the same thing as the radius in the xy plane, and theta is the angle from the positive x-axis in the xy plane. And so then we know which cylinder we're on and which radius we have. The only other thing we need to know is how far up we are. So we add a height variable, which is z. And this is exactly the same as the Cartesian z. That gives us these equations to change coordinates. As I talked about last week, we want our coordinate changes to have the Cartesian coordinates as the output, so the input are the new coordinates. So if r, theta, and z are the new coordinates, the outputs x, y, and z are given by these equations. This tells us, as I just said, the Cartesian z is the same thing as the cylindrical z. If we do need to go backwards, these are the transformations for r and theta. z, of course, is still the same thing. I need the Jacobian. If I'm going to do change of variables with integration with different coordinate systems, I need to know what the Jacobians are. So I take the coordinate transformation equations from the previous page. There are three inputs, uh, r, theta, and z, and three outputs, x, y, and z. So I get nine different partial derivatives. I've calculated them all here. I can put those partial derivatives in the three by three matrix, the Jacobian matrix. And I can take the determinant of that matrix that gives me the Jacobian of cylindrical coordinates is just the variable r. And that makes sense, since cylindrical coordinates are essentially polar coordinates, adding the ordinary Cartesian z. So the fact that they have the same Jacobian as polar coordinates matches that setup. As I did last week, I'm interested in looking at constant loci as a way of understanding coordinates. So for polar coordinates, we looked at constant radii and constant angles, and those gave us the spider web graph of concentric circles and rays as a way to understand sort of what the coordinate system looks like. So let me look at the three constant loci in spherical, or rather in cylindrical coordinates. If r is equal to c, we get a cylinder. That's an infinitely long cylinder oriented around the z-axis. So if r is equal to c, then I get this cylinder of radius r, and it goes up and down infinitely far. Uh, and that, that's where really the name of these things come from. We're trying to describe cylinders. If I look at instead theta to be a constant, well, that means that in the xy plane, in the circle, I have a fixed angle here. But I'm allowed to have any z above that. So what I actually get from that is I get a half plane going out in this angle from the z-axis. So all the points, if you sort of drop them down, would have angle theta. Um, no matter how far they are from the axis, no matter how high they are up, gives us a half plane. And lastly, z is the same thing as Cartesian z. So z equals c just gives me a horizontal plane at height, height c. So I can think of the cylindrical coordinate system as describing these half planes, these horizontal planes, and these cylinders. Let me now do some integrals to show you how this works. So let's say I have a region d which is given by these equations. What, is, what does this mean? Well, this is the same as r squared in polar, hence cylindrical coordinates. So r squared less than equal four. Well, it's the same as r less than equal two. So this is all radii up to two. So this is gonna describe a solid cylinder out to the radius two. And then I have a restriction on the height. The height goes from one to five. I have no restrictions on angles. So this is gonna give me a cylinder of radius two that's going to start at z equals 1 and go to z equals 5. Since it's a cylinder, I can describe it with 
constant bounds and cylindrical coordinates. So if I sort of took this integrand in Cartesian coordinates, the bounds in cylindrical coordinates are going to be theta. Outside and outside goes from 0 to 2 pi because I go all the way around the circle. The radius goes from 0 to 2. This equation said that the radius had to be between 0 and 2. And then the heights were actually given, so the height goes from 0 to 5. Remember, I work inside out. So the inside bounds and the inside variable have to match. So z is there, r is there, theta is there. I could put those in any order because they're constant. Later we'll have non-constant bounds, and of course, bounds that reference another variable need to be inside that variable. So this now becomes z is the same, squared x squared plus y squared, that's just r. So that becomes zr here. And then I have an additional r that I've added for the Jacobian. So my integrand is going to be zr squared, zr from the integrand, and r from the Jacobian. This is entirely separable. So I can actually split this up into three single variable integrals. So I move the theta over there, I get an integral just of d theta. There's an r times an r, so I get an r squared integral for r. And there's a z, and I can do those three integrals, simplify the answer down. And the integral of this function over this cylinder gives me a value of 64 pi. I want to calculate the value, the volume of a cone now. This is a cone with height h and radius r. And I want to set up this cone so that it is sticking up above the xy plane with its vertex at the origin. And so r is this radius here. This height here is h. And I want to use cylindrical coordinates to describe this cone. Now, it's not a cylinder, so I'm going to have to choose coordinates now that are no longer constant. But I can actually do this. To calculate volume, I want to integrate 1. So my integrand is just going to be 1. Let me describe how to calculate the bounds here. So the bounds in theta are just 0 to 2 pi. Theta is the angle going around in the xy plane. The cone has perfect circular symmetry. It goes all the way around. So I have no bounds in theta. So then I'm going to take z yet next, and I'm going to consider the minimum and maximum z's that I can have here. So z starts at 0, and then z goes up to h as I go to the, to the height. So then I have bounds on z. Now I want bounds on the radius. So in all of these heights, I have the radius going out. And the, the value that the radius can go out to gets larger as I go up the cone. The radius at the start is very small. The radius near the top of the cone is near capital R. So the radius starts at 0. These radii all start at the z-axis. I have radius 0. I need to figure out what this bound is. So I actually need to figure out what this line is. But I can think of this line as a line in the variables r and the variable z. And at the top here, uh, I see that the total height is h, and the total radius is r. So what I can write here is I can write that r is going to be this ratio times z. And that actually entirely describes this line, describing r in terms of z. What radius am I allowed in terms of what height I currently have? z, of course, is the variable going up from the xy plane. So that gives me my upper bound. My upper bound now depends on z. It has to be inside the z integral. So this r integral is inside the z integral. We have the same situation with iterated integrals as before as we have some variables inside others. All right, that's the setup. That's how I describe a cone. Um, there are other ways to do this, but this is, this is a reasonable way to do it. Then I just proceed through the integral. I separate out the theta integral. It's just d theta, so I get 2 pi there. I need to do the r integral here. I have an r from the Jacobian. It gives me r squared over 2. I evaluate that, and then I do this last integral. There'll be lots of integrals this week that I'm going to skip over the details of them. I've done the integrals in some detail in the, in the notes here in the slides, and also in the notes for your reference. So if you want to look at the careful details of integration, please do. But I'm going to try and get through the videos a bit more efficiently by not belaboring the details of integration. All right, I also want to try and find the volume of a paraboloid. So a paraboloid with the same sort of setup as this cone is a shape like this, where the cross section is a parabola instead of a triangle. Um, the paraboloid can be given by the equation z equals h over r squared x squared plus y squared, where r is the um, radius at the top of this, and h is the height. So I'd like to again calculate the volume of a paraboloid with base radius r and height h. 
I'm going to set this up the same way with variable bounds in cylindrical coordinates. This has complete circular symmetry. The, the cross sections of this are circles. I go all the way around the circle. There's no restriction on the angle, so I have 0 to 2 pi and theta. Here I'm going to have the radius actually outside. So I'm going to have the radius going from 0 to r. And then I want to figure out what the height is doing. So let me sort of look at a slice of this thing. My radius going from 0 to r out here. My height is going to go from here up to the top value here. And as I move out in the radius, I have different heights. So the top value of my height is going to be this h. And the bottom value is going to be the equation of this parabola. But I can actually get this directly from the equation of the paraboloid, because x squared plus y squared is just r squared. So here I have z equals h over r times r squared. That's going to be my lower bound. That's going to be where the z variable starts. And then the z variable is going to go up to the maximum fixed height at the top of its bounds. This is different from what I did before. In the previous example, I had, I had r inside z. Here I have z inside r. And that's, that's always an option. There are a variety of ways to set this up, depending on which variables and which integrals you want to have on the inside and which integrals you want to have on the outside. Again, I'm integrating 1 for volume, but I do have a Jacobian term in there. That little r in there is there for the Jacobian. And I can proceed with the details of the integration, which again, I will not belabor. But I get the conventional equation for the volume of a paraboloid with base radius r and height h, which is hr squared pi over 2.